you ever acted in anything? Um, anything that has been seen by the human world? Yeah, or like ever like had any kind of dramatic training or had anyone indicate to you that you have any sort of acting talent? Uh, I did take drama class. Uh, okay. I went to drama class in school. Uh, I did a little bit of like student film stuff. Nothing like major, but yeah, a little bit. Would you say you're a better actor than Hulk Hogan? A hundred percent. I I would say you could pull nine out of ten people off the street and put them into a film without having practiced, and they would be a better actor than Hulk Hogan. He's really bad. He is atrocious. I don't think I have ever... Um, seen dramatic parts of a film that I believed less than in this one. Yeah, what's weird is that they went for drama. I couldn't understand it. The choice blew me away. There's a lot in this movie that blew me away. Welcome to Bad Movies and Beer. I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. And today we are discussing a movie that I was very fond of as a child. And having watched it again now, some 30 years later... I don't know what the fuck was wrong with, like, 10-year-old me. I don't know what, was, what was that guy watching? Holy shit. Was there lead paint in my house? Why did I think this was good? <laughs> I had not seen this before. This was my first time, and... Uh, now, how is that possible? I mean... So you're a child of the 80s? Yeah, I was. Hulkamania uh, was running wild. I guess so. I even watched WWF Wrestling. Like, I was not um, separate from this kind of scene, but I had not seen this movie before. Do you think 10-year-old you would have liked it? I don't know. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Listen, it's if, hard. If, yeah, you think, it's if you think 10-year-old you is smarter than 10-year-old me, you can just say so. Right. I mean, that's probable. Because I, I think 10-year-old me was a fucking dunce based on how I've seen this. Based so, on you yeah. having fond memories of this. I'm not proud of my childhood at this it is, point. It is funny how some things we enjoyed age so poorly, and this has to be one of those things for you. I'm sure we've talked about movies on here that I loved when I was little that also haven't aged as well. Yeah, we're going to watch one of those later on this season, Tank Girl. Yeah, Fucking Lori Petty. <laughs> Big Tank Girl fan. I haven't seen that in probably 10 years. Great. And I'm still I'm holding out it. that uh, I, it is as good as I remember it. <laughs> well, I guess we're going to find that out later. But for today, yeah. we're going to be going through everything that happens in this action comedy romance. It, it, I think it would be best described as a wrestling made-for-TV movie. It should have been a made-for-TV movie. That's what it felt like to me the entire time I watched it, is that I was yeah. watching a made-for-TV movie, particularly the drama. Like, it almost felt like it should go into the Hallmark movie category. Yeah, or like the W Network or something. Yes, like yeah. that is the kind of movie it is, but it was created by the people who own and run WWF. I would say Cinemax, but it was decidedly PG in oh, a number of hilarious on, yes. ways that we'll cover later. Yeah, and that's actually probably one of the biggest problems I have with this thing. Well, this is your problem with every movie. Not enough nudity. It's all <laughs> this guy talks about I, where, where's the nudity more nudity <laughs> not even the nudity but we'll go into it in more detail definitely but first we have not a beer no it is a beer what that's a beer yeah well this I, i'm glad you're here because <laughs> i was about to say today we are drinking a barley wine yes which is apparently beer i'm just learning yes so um we're heading back to Great Lakes Brewery. So we've done a couple of their beers. We had thrust for our body of evidence <laughs> episode, right? Which I love that. Still tickles me. Yeah. <laughs> and then we did the limp puppet for our uh, puppet porno uh, special event. Yeah, uh, this will be our first non-sexual Great Lakes beer connection. <laughs> so the the beer we're drinking today is called the Beard of Zeus. Um, and in the movie, we're watching No Holds Barred. The main villain, his name Zeus. Yeah, so. this follows our launch tradition of picking up uh, beers named after the worst characters in movies. <laughs> Remember we did the fucking sheriff for uh, uh, Human Tornado? Yeah. So Awful. This, this kind of follows along that tack. So it's a barrel-aged barley wine. Now, it, it is deceptive. You were saying maybe we weren't drinking a beer. Uh, it is a beer because it is sugars taken from grains and turned into an alcoholic beverage. So they still take the grains, the barley, and they pull the sugars out and make it. Wines are made from the juice of fruit. I didn't think this was wine. I just thought barley wine was some drink that does not fall into the beer category. I'm aware that there is a difference between this and actual wine. Yes. Just no, put that out there. But the reason why they call it a wine is two things. One, the alcohol content. Um, this is an 11.8. So it is much closer to drinking a wine. Uh, and then the other reason is the complexity of flavor. Uh, quite a few breweries kind of dabble with. It's not a super popular style, but I think because of the alcohol content and complexity of flavor, but I think it's something that brewers really like to play with because it gives them sort of a different outlet and you can get a lot of different flavors. We were talking before and we both only ever had maybe one. 
they can have really distinct or different flavors depending on what the brewer has done. So uh, this could taste completely different from that, I think. So. Well, I hope so, because I recall not enjoying that <laughs> one. So hopefully this is something different. But an uh, added twist with this, this is not a recent release. No, so uh, barrel aged and also they bottle aged. So apparently these are better after they have been sitting around for a couple of years. And you've kept this one for a couple of years. It's uh, 2019, I believe. Holy cow. Yeah. So this has been aging for four years. Yeah, they, uh, the, <laughs> when they released it, they're like best after I think they said like two to three years. So we've gone we've gone almost a full four here, and we'll see if that adds to the complexity of flavor you're talking about. <laughs> so we're probably going to be really drunk, and hopefully we are not really sick after we drink this. But I think we'll be fine. I don't know. I'm looking forward to trying it. Well, let's get into it. Yeah. So before we see anything here, we get the unmistakable voices of Mean Gene Okerlund and Jesse the Body Ventura over the opening credits. After some to-be-expected comments about Ventura's outlandish outfits, they mention the sold-out crowd who is here to see the WWF champion, and that's who we see when we finally fade in. Hulk Hogan himself snarling and shaking his head side to side, wearing his trademark blue and white. Wait, what? <laughs> Oh, man, when we get the credits happening and you can hear the like wrestling commentators coming in, I knew that you were going to be excited. I was like, this is super nostalgic for Cooper. That here. took you back to come on. Uh, I did recognize both of them. Uh, I almost skipped over your comment there. I did find it weird that he was not wearing his trademark yellow. Um, I don't even know why they didn't just keep him as Hulk Hogan. Well, yeah, that's the thing. I was going to say, he isn't actually Hulk Hogan, although you'd never know it by literally everything that happens in this movie. No, his character's name is Rip who flashes his trademark rip em symbol and urges the insanely pumped up crowd of extras to rip em. <laughs> it's pretty rough. We know that Hulk Hogan was known for tearing off his shirts, and I guess that's where this is coming from. This seems like some kind of weird altered universe. Yeah. Like it is the same person, but it doesn't feel like it's in our world. Um, the crowd here is really into it, but I'm also struggling to know the time frame. I didn't look on the like DVD when this came out. So 89. So it was er, late 80s. Yeah, literally. In fact, this month, we are about 24 years away from all of this playing out in real time, including Zeus making his WWF debut, like in real life. He wrestled some matches. Oh, really? To promote the movie. Yeah, they brought him in to actually like fight Hulk Hogan oh, in that's a couple hilarious. of TV matches. Yeah, yeah, it all happened like 24 years ago this month. So this was the brainchild of someone at, the, Vince McMahon, a hundred percent. So this, this is, is yeah, this is his baby. Uh, he probably wrote it too, right? Based on yeah, the quality wrote it, of it, uh, produced it, aggressively mated to it. You know, all yeah. the things that Vince McMahon would do. <laughs> So that makes more sense to me because I was struggling to place it. I also don't understand why it's called No Holds Barred. <laughs> I mean, I think that's pretty clear as we go along. But first, before that happens. Uh, Rip is accompanied to the ring here by his trainer, I guess, Tony, and also his brother, Randy, who we learn via Mean Gene's commentary, Rip has been more than a brother to, especially after the tragic death of their parents. Just seamless how they worked this in here. It was so subtle, I almost missed it. <laughs> so this is where I'm already getting holiday movie, TV made for movie vibes here, right? The Rip character is now the only one that this boy has left right this teenage boy has left and you know that that's going to come back up oh god yes 100 percent. yeah <laughs> they're going to use that for sure yeah there's not a lot of subtlety in the plot here or in the way they're working things out this is where i kind of figured vince mcmahon had a large role in this there's no subtlety at all which is a classic vince mcmahon trademark now rip's opponent for the night is number one contender jake bullet who's rocking the teased hair and smoky eyes of a young Pat Benatar. <laughs> and Rip makes short work of him, much to the delight of the crowd. But not everyone who's watching is quite so thrilled. We see a rival television executive watching from his boardroom. He's acting very smug when it appears Rip might be on the cusp of defeat. But by the end of the match, he is positively livid, throwing his remote at the wall and making his feelings clear to the other executives. I guess there'll be no thunderous celebration here, huh? Not when you're last in the ratings. Again! I want that jock ass on this network. 10 o'clock, tomorrow, boardroom. Talk to me. And just like that, we've got what's going to pass for our plot. <laughs> oh my goodness. So this match is pretty quick. Now, I will say, in sort of 
classic Hulk Hogan style, the person fighting against him has him ready to go down, and we get that like rally and get he back up, up stance. He, he hulks, hulks up, up and takes him out. So you you know that we're gonna start with that, and I can only assume that when we fight the big bad at the end of the movie, we're gonna get the exact same thing. This is every Hulk Hogan fight oh ever. They're God. all like this. Yeah, every single fight is the exact same. We are introduced to this rival network in exec, and we're getting an extreme and what will be consistent overacted uh, <laughs> angry yeah, executive wow. position. I recognize the person who's acting it, but I couldn't pull his name. Wayne's World. He's Kurt Fuller. Oh, he, yes. he also plays this lead, like Rob Lowe's secondhand man in Wayne's World. It's probably what I know him best. He's been in a bunch of stuff, though. Yeah, that makes sense. That I, I make that connection now that you've said it. So he's the head of WTN, that rival network, and they do not like that Rip is getting all of the best ratings. This is when TV ratings were the king of raising advertising revenue, and yeah. he needs it at his network instead. So we know he's going to be going after trying to get Rip to be a part of his company, too, or to fight on his network, I would expect. Yeah. You know what else he doesn't like? Jock asses. Oh, That's my his God. His I go laughed insult. so hard. <laughs> he calls him a jock ass like... I don't know, probably half a dozen times. Oh, in this easily, movie. yeah. And I have never heard that term before. Me neither, man. Like you, just you're call, co- you call someone a jock, but like it's like some weird, like derisive version. You jock of ass. <laughs> like I didn't, <laughs> didn't understand what that meant. Like obviously he doesn't like jocks, but he is also an ass. Like is it a combination of jock and jackass? I guess so. Yeah, maybe they're trying to put it insult. together. Was this a real insult? I don't think so. I don't right? think so, but maybe like. This because it is PG. This is what was like acceptable. I wonder if they had other words in and they had to change it to keep the rating because the this sort of insult doesn't make sense to me. No, me neither. Now you mentioned television ratings a second ago, and as we see the next day, this movie is apparently set in a world where the WWF is the highest rated television product of all time, and Hulk Hogan, I'm sorry, Rip, not sure how I confused those two, is the biggest star in the world. Now the smarmy executive we were just talking about, Mister Brell, is his name is absolutely desperate to get Rip, and I guess therefore the WWF on his station, like you said. He's even desperate enough to bring Rip in for a meeting and hand him a blank check to break his contract with the other network. As you can imagine, this does not go well for him. (laughs) He says what this network needs, it gets, right? He's not used to hearing no for an answer. We get the Rip character, our Hulk Hogan character here, He rolls up to this place just dressed in, I don't know how to describe this outfit. So we had, back in Spookies, Duke was wearing a leather karate gi. This is not exactly that, but it appears to be like leather weight training gear, I guess. Yeah, with a bunch of spandex like worked in here too, and I'm kind of confused. It it looks like a spandex biker outfit almost, I would describe it as. Biker slash... Martial artist. If you combined a motorcycle enthusiast with a 1980s fitness guru, <laughs> that's what you'd have. It's like yeah. Richard Simmons if he was into leather. Uh, so he's not going to take the money, so much so that he shoves the check in the mouth of our evil TV executive, almost makes him choke on that offer of money. And this does not go down well with our TV exec. What would you think of his line here at the end after he shoves the check in the guy's mouth? Do you remember it? Oh, God, I won't, uh, I won't be here when this clears. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of funny. He's he's using the bowel movement yeah. for clear as a, yeah, that's actually when kind of When it clears of your ready. colon. Yeah. That's the best line in this whole movie, probably. Um, the if, delivery, maybe not. <laughs> the delivery, maybe not. But the line itself is good. <laughs> um, if Rip thought he was just going to be able to say no and still get a free limo ride home, he's got another thing coming. The driver, acting on orders from Mr. Brell, tries to take him somewhere else, I guess. We'll find out in a couple minutes. But Rip isn't having it. He kicks the limo door so hard he dents them from the inside. And this, along with him banging on the partition, inexplicably causes the driver to smash into a bunch of stuff, including like a security gate. I don't really know how to describe this. It's kind of like a chase scene, only the limo driver is trying to get away from the guy in the back seat. Why is he crashing into so many things? I don't understand why... Our Hulk Hogan, our Rip character, kicking doors is making him lose control of the limo. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, he's not kicking it enough that it's moving the car far enough that he's going to crash into stuff. He was told to take him to the garage, okay. which I guess is a place where they punish people who don't give them what they want. Um, and we're going to find that out soon after like driving around and crashing into a bunch of stuff. They pull into this sort of deserted garage and we see some hooligan or thug looking people who have pipes and weapons who are ready to sort of maybe beat down Hulk Hogan. But 
how does he uh, emerge from this limo? Oh my god, dude. He jumps out of the roof of the limo and immediately starts beating these guys up. But when I say jumps out the roof, I don't mean like he climbs out the top and over the side. He literally jumps out of the roof. He gets like 15 feet in the air and lands on the roof of the limo, roaring at them as he does it. This was absurd. He kind of exploded the roof of the limo like the Kool-Aid man does a wall. But there was a sunroof, wasn't there? No, because... The, well, there was no sunroof? He just punched through the fucking... He exploded up through the hard metal roof of the limo? Yes. I thought there was a sunroof. So there was a sunroof, but they okay. they pressed a button and it closed a metal sheet over it. Like, there was like a trap mechanism in the back of this thing to keep him locked in. And he just exploded through Jesus that Christ. metal trap Does it slow down air? even a little bit? He's so no. high up in the air. He jumps higher than any man has ever jumped in the history of time. <laughs> it lands on top of it and just starts demolishing these goons. He throws at least three of them through windows, which is hilarious. I actually like that that kept happening. And yeah. then he's, he, like, takes out the one who's trying to hit him with a pipe. And he is just dummying him all the while. The limo driver, the guy who brought him here, is, like, shaking in his boots in the front seat. Well, and he should be because once Hogan's done uh, dispatching with these guys, he immediately rips the door off the limo, pulls out the driver, and holds him up, snarling and growling in his face until he notices something. What's that smell? I just like to point out that you and I have a combined four college degrees. What are we doing here? I was, <laughs> what is this? I was blown away at this moment. I was oh. like, who is this written for? Vince like that, that joke is literally a joke for a five-year-old. Vince McMahon. Holy fuck. He I likes was poop like, humor. Oh my God. So this limo driver is pissed and shit himself. Um, and that was well, what he on. thought was we the We only payoff. know that he shit himself. We don't know if he's pissed himself. There was the the wet spot they put on his pants <laughs> okay, of course is he massive, himself. right? Yeah. So he's clearly pissed himself. He shit himself. And so he's not going to get his ass kicked by Hulk Hogan, I guess. I mean, this whole scene is just absurd. Yeah. I don't understand why they chose to have... Both the Hogan character and the Zeus character later, like, express most of themselves through growls. They're like wild animals. Yeah. He's like a wild animal. Yes. Yeah. And it's just, it's completely baffling to me. The only, like, thing I can think of is it was just too hard for him to deliver more lines than he does. That's, yeah, that's my theory for Zeus that we'll see later, too. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But, yeah, this this payoff joke at the end was so disappointing. I'm embarrassed. Like, yeah. literally. Yeah. Literally. Oh, God. Yeah. What are we doing here? I don't understand <laughs> it. I, I asked myself that several times while watching this movie <laughs> <laughs> well here we go let's keep it going in the next scene rip is meeting with some executives who i guess are from his current network either way the lady running this meeting introduces herself her name is samantha moore and she's got some big ideas for what rip should do next he's got some big ideas for her too but based on hulk hogan's hammy facial expressions these ideas are mostly sexual <laughs> he's just leering at her man he seems like he finds her quite attractive he doesn't find her proposals that attractive, though. It seems like it doesn't fit his brand. She is very corporate. She wants him to monetize most of his actions here. And all he can say back to her is, what about the charity work? Yeah, he's big into charity work. Do you think uh, a few women in the 80s looked up from a bar and saw Hulk Hogan staring at them the way he was staring at that lady there? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say more than a few. <laughs> Probably, right? And he banged it with this giant dong. Does he have a giant dong? Is Did that you ever see any of those Hulk Hogan sex tape photos? No. Oh, my God. It's like a thermos. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. How did they keep this then a PG movie? By keeping that thing contained. Yeah. Barely in one scene. But <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, well, as you mentioned, he's all about the charity work. And after telling her this, Samantha decides she wants to hear more about it. I'll pick you up. Eight o'clock. Dinner. Dressy. I don't know why he couldn't have just fucking told her about right then in that meeting. But of course, then we wouldn't have our fancy restaurant scene. Uh, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> you didn't like this one? Oh, no. I thought this could be your uh, favorite scene in the movie. I hated it. It's a great commentary on not judging a book by its cover and also classism. I thought you'd be all over yeah, it. Yeah, you thought I would be my... Yeah. yeah. So, of course, uh, our Hogan character is supposed to be a bit of an everyman, and we are at a French restaurant. We get the most stereotypical French waiter possible. Hang on. You're upset about the stereotypical French waiter? Uh, I'm upset of about all the a things, lot okay, of the stereotypes say, in this movie if we're going to go there. But, this scene uh, has the most are. of the minute for the But record. yeah, this yeah. one has significant number of them. The waiter uh, assumes that he's an idiot and doesn't know or understand any of the food and even like 
says that to him, only for the chef and the rest of the kitchen to come out and have a personal relationship with him already. He speaks French to the chef. He, well, yeah, he's clearly more cultured than uh, the maitre d' and also Samantha, too. She wasn't sure if he knew yeah. something on the menu. They didn't. They assumed that he was dumb, and he shows them that he is not here, right? Although he's an everyman, he is also still cultured, or at least enjoys his food. Yeah, there's a clear agenda in this scene. It's meant to subvert everyone's expectations about what kind of person a pro wrestler is and vicariously what kind of people wrestling fans are. And, you know, this might have worked if only Hulk Hogan was a better actor or the people watching this weren't already 100% wrestling fans. That's your whole audience for this movie. Like, who are you trying to convince? It's really weird, right? Like, I'm... They are trying to show different sides of culture here. We're starting with a wrestling match at the very beginning of this that is the standard group, like, mixed people who would be at a wrestling match, right? And by the end of this, we're at, like, a wrestling match where it's all people in, like, fancy dress outfits and shit. And I'm confused about why that is the, like, target market for what wrestling is or maybe they're saying that's not what it's supposed no, that, to be the opposite those are the bad people see the, the mm. true the, the good people the salt of the earth people are those original fans and that's We're what they're trying to tell it's us it's a real right? class yeah. commentary right. here yeah. I'm telling you alright and we get some more of that juxtaposition in our next scene as we transition from Rip, the common man in a high-class restaurant, to Brell and a couple other executives in an absolute shithole of a bar, one that features bare-knuckle fighting, a waitress with a pretty clear sinus infection, and also a little person in a cage. The premise here is that Brell is hoping to find something that can counteract Rip and the WWF's television dominance, but really this is all meant to provide us with extreme fish-out-of-water comedy. They definitely got the fish-out-of-water part right. Not sure about the comedy. Yeah, this is pretty rough. Uh, This is where the TV executives, two sort of lackeys, are supposed to be carrying the comedic weight, and it's not going very well. They definitely don't feel comfortable in this place. They head off to the washroom, and on the wall it says the VD room, which I guess is venereal disease. That's what it stands for. Yeah, so it's pretty rough. Uh, They're in the washroom, and they're like talking all this shit, and then a guy from the bar, the brother of the waitress, comes out, and he's going to smash the two of them for being insulting of the place. But then he sees their penises. Yeah. <laughs> he lets them go because they have tiny d- <laughs> <laughs> And you're just like, oh, my gosh. And we're going to come back uh. to that humor, too. So McMahon is really, like, going for some highbrow humor shit here. Oh, God. This is all so lowbrow, man. And we're not, like, opposed to lowbrow humor, for sure. But this is, no. like, childhood joke yeah, level. The, the quality of this is so low. There's no craft here at all. But yeah, that's his rationale for letting them go. They have tiny dicks. Uh, but good news is, they, along with Brell, managed to get out of here without getting murdered or robbed. And they're not just leaving with their minuscule c***. Brell's also leaving with an idea for a new show, The Battle of the Tough Guys. <laughs> so this is his new reality TV show, right? This is going to be a tournament where he's going to put the toughest people against each other. And we know there's going to be some way that they're probably going to try to pull Rip in here. He doesn't seem to care about the money, though, so that's not going to pull him in. Um, But we'll have to find out later what will get him involved in this world. If you can't see this coming a mile away, then you have not (laughs) been paying attention to any 80s movie that involves relatives. Um, Yes, as you mentioned, this is basically a no-holds-barred fighting contest, get it? Which Brell lays out in his full pitch. The competition will be open to any red-blooded American man who's got the guts to get into the ring and find out just how tough he is. The winner will receive one hundred thousand dollars tax free and as we quickly see while rip doesn't want to do it he's got a whole bunch of other takers yeah we got a whole bunch of stereotypes of strongman here of different groups um kind of these hilarious 80s stereotypes of what a tough guy is um and we're going to uh head on and see this no holds barred match soon Yeah, this is basically a freak show, and they all battle it out for a while until a huge black guy busts in like the Kool-Aid man and starts tossing people all over the place. We see Rip and brother Randy watching at home just awestruck by this guy's power, but it turns out that Tony, who is also there, recognizes him immediately as someone he used to train. It isn't until this guy is done manhandling everyone else in the bar and Brel declares him the winner that we finally learn the intimidating stranger's name. Zeus. Oh my goodness. He, after he breaks through the wall, he picks a woman up by her head and tosses her into like <laughs> a barrel. I don't know. Um, it's really, really hokey. He has a unibrow and one of his eyes yeah, is Why does working. he have a unibrow? I've never understood that. I, I don't understand at all. Um, is that meant to be more intimidating? I mean, it certainly makes him seem crazy. They definitely make him appear to be someone who is off his rails. Like he's not yeah. managing well with life here. 
Uh, turns out he spent some time in jail for beating somebody. That's pretty what Tony brutally, tells us. Right? Yeah. Tony tells us that. When I was looked this movie up, they called it a racial battle. Like uh, literally in the like things describing this movie, they describe it as a racial battle. So I was kind of like, oh my God, was there an intention at the time? Uh, I don't know. Cause, cause Hogan is Tony's black. Hulk Hogan's trainer is black. So it's not, it's not a race thing. I, I know. And it, it was just interesting to see that obviously the hero in the eighties was Hulk Hogan, a, a white guy. Well, of and course. the villain was this, I mean, like big Rocky, prisoner black Rocky, guy. Rocky yeah, three. Exactly. Same thing. See, yeah. Yeah. We're getting the same kind of, your, your, your villains had to be black or Russian. Yeah. In the 80s. That was basically it. That was just it. Right. And so they're, they're going to one of those stereotypes here too. Uh, and of course he was an ex prisoner. He is a yeah. massive man. He is. Yeah. He is a big man. Very, very strong. I could see him being intimidating. He beats the shit out of everyone here. Wins us hundred grand. Yes, and we quickly learn a few things about Zeus. First, that his fighting style mainly involves choking his opponents, throwing them, or smashing his two fists down on either side of their neck. And also, that other than telling people his name, he mostly communicates by growling, as we see the next round of the Battle of the Tough Guys, where he destroys a big steel worker. And I don't know about you, but I've got this as a distant third in my 80s steel mill movie scene rankings, behind Flashdance and, of course, Cobra with Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're right. I think the the ratings that you've chosen here are right. I like the Cobra one. I also think maybe we got one in the Highlander. We kind of had some industrial New York City fights That's true. too in that. So a Highlander might too. Where are they in a steel mill in Commando when he puts the pipe through? It's possible. This might right? be fifth on my list now. Yeah. <laughs> what we've learned is those industrial settings seem to encourage some pretty good fight scenes. Definitely a good location for uh, battle scenes in the 1980s. Sure, yeah, it's steamy. It's hot. There's like dirt and grime and metal clanging sparks. shadows. Sparks also. Sparks tend to add some uh, tension to a battle. Yeah. Speaking of tension, any concerns Rip might have had about Zeus seem like a distant memory in our next couple of scenes as he heads out on some kind of promotional tour with Samantha after first introducing her to his brother Randy, who you will remember is an incredibly important part of his life because Mean Gene Okerlund told us so, and then thwarting a robbery attempt at his favorite local restaurant. Two men enter with guns drawn, and he somehow manages to stand up, rip a couple of counter stools out of the ground, and throw them across the room with these guys before either one of them notices or shoots him. And I should mention that not only is he basically seven feet tall, he's also wearing a bright blue spandex outfit that you'd think might catch the eye of these two robbers. <laughs> uh, this whole scene is just baffling. The characters in this movie are more ridiculous than the characters in the WWE or WWF. Yeah, they kind of are, like, more cartoony. Yes, in a way. Yeah. yeah, like, it's less serious than that, which is quite a stretch. Um, this scene in the diner is ridiculous. He picks up a stool, rips it out of the floor, and throws it and takes out one of the like gunmen immediately. And then we have one guy left with a gun. He's kind of waving the gun around, but Hogan is using cream pies to fucking hit him in the face <laughs> and stop him from shooting him. I he's, forgot about the he's pies. He's throwing cream God pies across the diner, and they keep hitting this guy with a gun in the face. Until Hogan is able to rush up and basically disarm him. He moves I, so slowly, though. How did they not I, shoot him? Like, this took him forever. I, I mean, absolutely, they would have killed him in a real situation. It is a movie, though, and one that is PG. So you know this happening. What I'm thinking the entire time, though, is the amount of damage he is causing by smashing everything and, like, smashing these guys through tables is going to cost way more than the petty cash that would have lost from them walking away with the money. <laughs> That's a great point, yeah. Like, Hogan, He'll pay it back. Hogan literally guy. smashes the whole place up in order to capture these two guys yeah. rather than letting them walk away with, like, $200 in cash. You know what, though? The, the owner of the restaurant doesn't seem to care. Everyone's very happy. And Samantha is suitably impressed with his heroism. It even seems like she might be giving him the same f*** me eyes he was sending her way earlier. But when they arrive at the hotel that night to find out they've mistakenly been put in the same room, she's suddenly a lot more standoffish. And thus begins what is, in a weird way, the most poorly acted scene in this whole movie. They decide to go for a weird combination of rom-com flirting and introspective drama, and they do not pull it off. Not even a little bit. Oh, God, no. This is rough. I mean, it's interesting. When we're at the end of that diner scene, there's a point where you think he's going to be able to have a threesome with the diner owner and Sam. Like, they're both <laughs> all over him. If this was not a PG movie, <laughs> he would have been f***ing them both on yeah. the counter of that diner. <laughs> Good lord. Yeah. <laughs> that cream pie would, would have been, been a different little different. kind of cream yeah, pie. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Now, when they get back to that hotel, it gets a little oh. awkward because there's only one bed in one room. 
<laughs> Hogan proceeds to set up his own little tent. He takes tape and puts it across the entire room and then spreads a blanket over the middle of the bed so they each have their side. Yeah, it's like a wall. It's like a, like a makeshift wall. Yeah. He, like, strips down to his sort of sleeping slash workout gear and we get the Sam character go in the bathroom she decides that even though they're sharing a room and she's uncomfortable with him, she's going to get into, like, basically 80s lingerie to sleep. Well, she has, like, little shorts on, but she's wearing only a bra, which she then tries to sleep in later. What woman sleeps in a bra? No woman would ever do this. It was really weird. Yeah, I found her, like, sleep attire problematic. I think this was an attempt to make it slightly titillating for the young boys who were watching this movie. Like, that's definitely the audience of this. So they both have a very awkward conversation. There's weird tension. He's basically calling her a prude and, like, she doesn't have fun. And she's like... I'm too busy. I work too much for that. Like, I can't. They're both kind of, like, lonely. He sympathizes with that. Yeah, yeah. they are both kind of lonely. Uh, and you're just like, oh, this is so bad. Like, it's I was really, really, bad, really yeah. struggling. It's poorly acted. But she seems to go to sleep. But then she wakes up to what might be the funniest moment in this Well, movie. I was going to say, if you think the drama was bad, the comedy in this scene is oh just God. as bad, if not God. worse. She wakes up, and the other side of the bed is just a rocking and rolling. Squeaking. Like, there's, like, heavy breathing. And... All you can assume is that he is just fucking t***ing the shit out of his <laughs> c on the other side. Like, that's that has to be what they are insinuating, right? Yeah, or that lady from the restaurant caught up with them. She and came is, over, yeah. And, yeah, and she's over there, um, which could be true, too. Uh, but she doesn't just fall back asleep. I guess it's hard when your bed is bumping up and down that much. She decides to go down to the foot of the bed. And what is Hogan doing? <laughs> He's aggressively doing push-ups off the end of the bed while wearing only bright orange European cut underwear. Oh, my God. They are so short. These are the ones <laughs> where, like, when you described his hog as large, I was like, it's barely being contained in there. Like, it should be coming out the bottom. They're like bikini bottoms. Like, yeah. 80s oh, yeah. bikini bottoms that he's wearing. Yeah. Yeah. So he jokes with her. He finishes his, his workout He tells gear. her not to wait up for him. Yeah. She tries <laughs> to lay down and go back to bed. But when he jumps on the bed, what happens? Well, he's enormous, so when he flops down in the bed, it breaks, which causes her to, like, roll on top of him. And she, of course, gets angry and accuses him of doing it on purpose. And this is where we get the big dramatic moment in this scene. He rips that makeshift divider off the wall and tells her, If you don't need this, you build bigger walls than I ever could. Now, okay. <laughs> Not only is this a fairly enormous emotional leap, but unless I'm wrong, this is literally the second day they've ever spent time together. Like, their initial meeting and the dinner was day one, and this is the first day of this trip they're on. That's two days. So why is he already frustrated that he won't lower her guard and let him into her heart? And she's his boss. Or wait, is she his boss? I can't even tell. But this is completely <laughs> absurd. Yeah, he's used to women just opening their legs, not necessarily their heart to him whenever he wanted. So he, he is sort of confused right now why she's not ready to bone down. I mean, I get, maybe he just really wants her to be into it. He wants the romance part. Maybe he's tired of banging random floozies on the road. He wants something meaningful. Mm, he needs this in his life. He wants to have a good mom example for his brother, Randy. Well, he's not Randy's dad. He's Randy's brother. <laughs> but he's he acting as his dad, right? I, I mean, guess. yeah, with well, his parents gone. Bad news either way. It turns out in the next scene that Samantha is evil, or rather that Brell hired her to convince Rip to join his network by any means necessary. And yes, that includes encouraging her to seduce him and setting up the whole one room situation as a way to make it happen. Now, she is unhappy about that, and when she fires up at Brell, he slaps her right in front of the other executives. But because it's the 80s, they do nothing, and he's allowed to just keep on being an executive. Um, Not a surprising reaction. They are... Thankfully, at least the other guys seem to be like upset at this, although their conscience seems to disappear later in the movie when they're fully willing to kidnap her. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, they're like quietly upset. They don't, no one says anything or no, they kind of look a little no. uncomfortable on the face, but they do not in any way chastise him. Yeah, I thought for a second they were going to go after her, but she gets out of there and heads back to a rip character. She goes to see Hulk, and then we get some more of this drama that is just not even close to being pulled off. Yeah, you're right, and they keep making these choices. She goes running to Rip to confess everything, and in addition to the drama, we get some extremely PG romance here. He, like, tickles her for a bit, and they exchange a couple of packs until a TV interview with Zeus mercifully breaks up these grade school shenanigans. 
Turns out he can talk after all, and he challenges Rip to a fight. And as we see the next day at some kind of charity wrestling picnic, Zeus is not going to take no for an answer. Oh my gosh, this picnic is hilarious. What it's- is this event? Is it to raise money for the restaurant he destroyed? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I mean, it looks like a charity event for children. I don't see many parents here. It's just a whole lot of children plus Rip and his sibling and their friends. And you're like, this is weird. Uh, It's a little uncomfortable. Hogan's making the kids wrestle. Yeah. And he's like, while they're wrestling, he's saying that like they're both winners for trying and having fun. And you're just Just getting a positive message. man. Oh, my God. You're just getting an out of control positive message coming from the Rip character. This volunteer stuff's going on. And. All of a sudden, it's interrupted by the sound of a helicopter. Yeah, that, of course, is Brel, along with his cronies and Zeus. And he's basically there to, again, challenge Rip to the fight because Brel is also not taking no for an answer. And when this doesn't work out, he sends a man to intimidate Samantha. Luckily, Rip just happens to be nearby his motorcycle, and he, like, drives close to the guy to scare him off. And uh, this- <laughs> Hold on, hold on. I need to stop you here. Yeah. He does more than drive close to the guy. Does he? Yeah, let me... So uh, two I things kind of buzzes him, doesn't he? No. He literally drives his Harley at the guy, picks him up, drives him at a tree and breaks, and the guy flies off headfirst into the tree, crashes to the ground unconscious. Well, that's a lot more action than I thought we got in this scene. Oh, it's brutal. We can see, though, that the TV executive is ramping it up here. He's going after Sam and roughing her up. Who do you think the next target of this is going to be? Well, this is the thing. In the next scene, we see Zeus training. I guess you'd call it training. He's beating the fuck out of some guy. And brother Randy is inexplicably there with one of his friends taking all this in. What the fuck is he doing there? What a terrible idea. If you're fucking your, your brother's being accosted by this network executive your brother's girlfriend just got fucking almost kidnapped and assaulted. And you're like, hey, I'm going to go over there where that Zeus guy is and see what he's up to. Like, of course this goes exactly the way you would think it does. Brell spots Randy when he finds his rich brother, brings him over to where Zeus is. Zeus, by the way, wearing the classic WWF outfit here with the big silver buckle and the Zeus down the side of his fucking tights or whatever. And Randy gets so upset about all the bad things they're saying about his brother that he punches Zeus in the face, which has to go down in the absolute pantheon of bad ideas. Still, you got to love them busting out the paint by numbers 80s action playbook here, right? (laughs) This could have been predicted by anyone, including the 10 year olds that we were when we watched it. Uh, There's so much that happens to make it all work out, right? They're leaving after the fight, Randy and his friend, and they happen to crash into, like physically run into the network executive. His friend mentions that he is Rip's brother, right? Big mistake. What the fuck? That guy's out of the friend group. If I was was Randy, I'm like, you know what, dude? He doesn't kick him out, but he should have been out. But uh, so the, the friend gives him up. Of course, he punches Zeus and then... We're not sure what happens after. We know Zeus kicks the shit out of Randy. I'm wondering, is he dead? What's going on? Well, we find out pretty soon. He's in a fucking coma and, like, maybe paralyzed. Like, Zeus has really damaged this guy. Zeus goes for the neck a lot, we notice, in his attacks. Yeah, and it didn't seem like Zeus did much to him in the physical actions we saw, but apparently it did a lot of work on Randy. It's just so, so ridiculous. So we transition from him, like, getting his ass beat to him being in a hospital. Yeah, and... I think to highlight the absurdity of all this, like he should now be in jail again. We know he was in jail for assault. He just crippled a kid. Like at this point, he's back in jail. Yep. The movie should end right here with Zeus going back to jail and the network executive going to jail. But it doesn't because, you know, we're in a movie. And obviously Rip is furious about this, which he demonstrates by showing up at Zeus's training facility, a real one, not the burned out warehouse the last scene was set in, and trashing the place, screaming, Zeus! Over and over again. And it's clear that the showdown is going to happen after all. But just in case he needed an extra push, which side note, he definitely doesn't. Brell has set up like cameras and monitors and is literally sending rip messages, hyping up Zeus while taunting him and his brother. This is totally unnecessary, but it does lead to an incredibly dramatic slow motion charge where rip smashes what looks like Zeus, but is really just his image projected onto a mirror. And this is where it dawned on me. Hulk Hogan is really trying here. 
<laughs> like he is seriously <laughs> trying his best, which just oh. makes this even sadder. He Hogan is trying. He just does not have the acting chops. He does not have yeah. the ability to express emotion. I don't know if that's a combination of the roids or like. Oh, the, easy now. Come on. Yeah. I mean, what are you talking about? Easy would steroids now? affect your acting ability? I don't know. They he you'd think his anger would come off as realistic based on the roids he was taking, but I don't know. Well, the anger comes off more realistic than the emotions we see in the next little sequence All here. The fucking drama. Oh my god, oh. dude. We get some more of the serious drama in the next few minutes as we get to a hospital scene where Randy wakes up as he was in a coma and Hulk Hogan attempts to cry which wow this is actually killing me at this point <laughs> trying yeah. to watch him act this hard and it not being successful at all this is where if you put this on the television and you, like you just came across this on the TV you would have walked away at this point or changed the channel yeah. like you wouldn't have been able to handle this I can see your notes from here it literally says I hate this <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it's not going well. But okay, hang on though. Because I know you pretty well. Things have to pick up in the next set of scenes here as we enter a training montage, but not the kind you might think. While we do get several shots of Zeus aggressively working out, Rip's side of this is him helping his brother with physiotherapy and generally trying to nurse him back to health. What an odd choice this was. Yeah, it was interesting. Like right after putting I hate this in my notes, I also wrote this payoff better be good. Yeah. Right, We know we're leading to the big battle between the two of them, and I'm hoping for something to be awesome. We are seeing Randy get a little better. He's struggling, the acting and in his physical performance, but he's starting to move. <laughs> he is. And at the end of this, the day of the big fight is finally here. Brel's boss has some concerns over what will happen if Rip beats Zeus. What he doesn't know, though, is that Brel has a plan that will prevent this from ever happening. He has a couple of goons grab Samantha when she's wheeling Brother Randy into the elevator backstage, and he tells Rip that if he cares about her safety, he'll take a dive at the 10-minute mark. And like I said, why isn't this guy in jail? At this point, just call the cops. If you're Rip, you don't need to do this fight. Get on the horn to 911. Samantha will vouch for the kidnapping. Randy will vouch for the kidnapping. Tony will vouch for the kidnapping. This guy's going to fucking, hey, Randy, why are you in a wheelchair? That guy fucking assaulted me under orders of this guy. They'd all be in jail, and we'd all be on our way. Yeah, no, you're right. It doesn't make any sense. The fact that it's a movie is what keeps us moving. It makes me wonder how uh, Vince McMahon feels about TV executives and the decisions. Like, is this character at all driven by his own persona? Any psychiatrist could have a field day just dissecting what this movie means for Vince McMahon's fucking uh, mindset. Like, you, you have a feast here. He must not feel like the actions of this guy are... S like, they're clearly making the TV executive the villain... But his actions that are illegal don't seem to have consequences. And that, to me, says something about Vince McMahon. I don't know. <laughs> For sure. Now, we obviously can't call the cops, we've already said. So instead, Rip tells Tony he's got 10 minutes to find her. And with that taken care of, it's time to head to the ring. What would you think of Zeus's outfit here? Oh, my gosh. The... I mean, that belt buckle you described earlier is pretty glorious. The big Z metal belt buckle I enjoyed. But he has these shoulder pads that have been created out of metal. And they are just Are hilarious. they metal? They were just like shiny. Like, they look like those things that people put across their cars to like stop the sun from making their car too hot. You know, something like a windshield. <laughs> those sort of aluminum foil yeah, things man. that go on there. Yeah, it's pretty hilarious. He is also always wearing these metal bracers. These like what look like steel bracers on his wrist. Yep. And he uses those to smash his opponents a whole bunch what i noticed as we get into the fight here very early he hits uh hulk hogan with it and it leaves a paint mark on his back because they're so sweaty <laughs> and i'm like well those clearly aren't metal no man i was gonna spend about 30 bucks on this outfit which is quite a contrast to all the tuxedos and evening gowns in the crowd he takes off those giant silver shoulder pads and they have a brief stare down before Zeus knees Rip right in the thermos to gain the advantage. Rip is taking some damage here. <laughs> the he, thermos, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Rip's taking some damage here. His infirm brother is very concerned, but he manages to turn things around while keeping an eye on the clock. As we see after a cut to the room where they're holding Samantha, though, she might not need him to last 10 minutes after all. Yeah, she is able to sneak past these idiot guards and uh, network executives. And well, they're watching the fight. They get so yeah. captivated by the fight that they don't even watch Which it anymore. Is funny. This fight is interesting. It's, of course, the same kind of uh, story that we have in every Hulk Hogan fight where he gets way down and gets beat up early and has to make a comeback. 
The crowd seems really into it, despite them not being a traditional wrestling crowd, which is pretty funny. I don't know what they're trying to tell here. It looks like people are either at a prom or an awards gala or they something. They just like success. This yeah. show is making money, and they like money. It's kind of going as you'd think it was. She escapes out there, but right after she escapes, they kind of notice, and we got a little chase going on now. Yeah, and if these guys even had a rudimentary understanding of how elevators work, they would have caught her right away. She gets in the elevator and is like pressing the door close button. One of them tries to grab the door, but his fingers slip off. And as it closes, they're just like banging on the outside, being like, damn it, press the fucking button. The doors will open back up. But no, <laughs> instead, they let her go. And she's riding all the way down to the ground floor where they do manage to catch up to her and try and grab her again. But enough time has passed for Tony and I guess that fucking friend who uh, caused Randy to become infirm to find the two of them. So she gets loose on the floor. But she sees, as do we, that Zeus is now firmly in control. In fact, it seems like he's about to break Rip's neck until Tony, of all people, gets Zeus's attention by yelling at him. How about that, huh? Turns out Tony's the real hero of this movie. <laughs> I mean, he saves Sam. He saves Rip. Trainers are the best. That's what we're learning here, that the uh, old, old man trainer is the key. I... At no point think that Rip is going to lose this match. Like, I don't care how many shots they're showing me. We know based on the rating and the audience for this movie that Rip is about to emerge and just start fighting back. Well, it's every 80s movie, though. We've been over this so many times. You always know. Of course, fucking Stallone or Schwarzenegger or Van Damme is going to win. We know this. We know this so well. And yeah, they're trying their best to sell this here. Everyone in this movie is overacting to a comical degree here. From Brell yelling, Zeus, you idiot, to Randy's, come on, Rip, to literally everything Zeus does. I'm surprised the screen didn't just burst into flames. They are all turned up to 11, and just when I thought things couldn't get more ridiculous, the two of them fight up to the studio's control center, where Rip lands several heavy blows before eventually knocking Zeus off a platform and through the ring. I would have absolutely died if when he crashed through it, it has been an outline of his body. But instead, it's a perfect circle, which does not even try to hide the way they did this effect. <laughs> it doesn't even try to show that they've pulled out the piece between it and it's everything. It's so clear. Like, yeah. It's so clear what they've done here. Oh, it's it's pretty bad. I mean, you could have seen this coming from a mile away. So many close-ups of them, like, being sweaty and yelling or grunting, including the TV executive, like you said. It's, it's a really big struggle here. I did kind of enjoy when they got into the crowd, though, and Zeus started knocking around Sam and his brother again. Again, you knew that that was rationing it up. He does eventually take him out by smacking him down, uh, like into the ring and it exploding. Uh, but he's not done yet. He's got one other villain he still needs to take out. That's true. Brell is still there. Now, he's been desperately trying to kill the video feeds ever since he realized Rip was going to win. And he did this by pulling out literally anything connected to the walls. Now, unfortunately for him, this left a significant amount of live electrical wires exposed. And when an angry Rip stalks towards him, flexing and growling, Brell backs right up into them and promptly gets electrocuted. And so the movie ends triumphantly, with Rip walking through the cheering crowd before turning to the camera, giving a big smile and throwing up the rip em sign, having just caused a man's death. Rip him! <laughs> I mean, it happened exactly as you said, except for one thing. The TV network executive did get one more jock-ass insult in before he hit the fryer. <laughs> he did call him a jock-ass again, yeah. <laughs> you stay away! Stay away, you jock-ass! And I laughed so hard. We do get, after he gives the rip em symbol, the freeze frame. That's which true. I know that you love. There was yeah. a plus one for an enjoyment right there. Um, and then we transition to a No Holds Barred theme song. Yeah, man. They sent us into the credits, the rockin' theme song. Murder. Yeah. <laughs> he's killed a guy. I'm I mean, so the, guy, the guy was evil. Uh, Still, he just, good. he just died. He just, did he kill Zeus too? Or does Zeus survive this fall? We don't know. They blood, did not. We don't find out in No Holds coming Barred out of his mouth. Yeah. Yeah, interesting ending here. You know it was coming. You knew that Rip was going to take down. I didn't think he was going to die. The fact that they killed the dude, that was a bit of a surprise for me. Yeah, I guess based on the trajectory of the rest yeah. of the movie, that was a bigger leap than I thought. I thought he'd but... go to jail. Scooby-Doo style. They'd take him off. He'd be yelling. I was going to get him back and whatever. You haven't seen The Last of Me, that kind of thing. No, yeah. dead. And no one cares. Yeah, everyone, everyone is just hooray. cheering. <laughs> They're all just cheering. It was rough, uh, definitely, to see that go down the way it did at the end. I mean... This whole thing was rough. To see this whole <laughs> movie go down, it was rough, man. Uh, yeah, I uh, I expected a little more, to be honest. But uh, I guess we're going to talk about it. I don't know why. Yeah, you don't know what? Know. I will say, too, the fact that they don't leave the door open for a sequel. There's no, like, shot of Zeus's hand rising up from the ring. I think they knew. They're like, you know what? 
grab the money and run. We're not getting a second <laughs> shot at this. That is what this kind of feels like, right? Just taking money out of the pockets of the average wrestling fan. Yeah. Right? They had to go see Hulk Hogan in a feature film, see him become the champion again or maintain his championship. I guess he never lost it in this one, despite that no. risk posed by Zeus. I don't know why he wasn't just Hulk Hogan. You're still calling the WWF. You got me and Gene and Jesse Vunter. He's clearly Hulk Hogan. Just call him Hulk Hogan. What are we clinging to at this point? Yeah, I don't understand why we had to do the weird alternate universe thing, but uh, the Rip character just didn't do it for me. No, and I guess we'll find out right now how much it didn't do it for you. We should probably transition to our ratings. The way we do this, we rate the movie on a scale of 1 to 10 two times. 1 to 10 for how bad it is. 1 to 10 for how enjoyable. And the goal is to find movies that are a 10 out of 10 on both scales, or what we call the Crit, Crit 20. 20, 20, 20, 20. And for me, it's going to be in play because this movie is 10 out of 10 bad. Like you said, this feels more like a made-for-TV movie or like a straight-to-video. The acting is fucking awful. Hulk Hogan has no business anchoring a movie um, the romance part with him and that lady, not even a little, they have zero chemistry, not even a little bit believable. The effects are fairly laughable. The stereotype characters, the fact that any of this is allowed to get as far as it does, but all those people going to jail, like I said, just completely unbelievable. It's impossible to invest in these characters in a serious way. This thing just stinks out loud. And I think it's a 10 out of 10 bad. What do you think? <laughs> There's no debating that. It yeah. is absolutely 10 bad. Yeah. I, I didn't even, like, often in my notes, I'll write down multiple, like, possible outcomes and decide based on our conversation. This was a straight 10 immediately. I was like, there's there's no chance. The story is so paint by numbers. You can tell Vince McMahon had a huge part in writing it. The acting is atrocious. I don't even think that there is a character that you could point to that did a good job. Like, is there a single Close, closest person? call? Maybe the network executive guy, Brel, maybe. But, but he's, so, he, he's so over the top exactly, with it, Exactly. He pushes it too far, and it, it becomes completely unbelievable. Um, the drama and comedy, neither worked. No. Right? Neither no. of those things pulled off. I felt it was a little bit slow. Like, there was a lot of extra time, despite it only being an... Because they made so many fucking dramatic scenes. Yeah. There's so much drama in this. They it's just ham-fisted. Ham-fisted. I, <laughs> I thought the sound was poor. Uh, the overdubbing of the voice and the effects I thought were bad. I thought the amount of grunting was, like, <laughs> just obnoxious. <laughs> yeah. More grunting than a porno. Like, you could make a porn version of this, and it would have less grunting. What do you think the screenplay, the pages of the screenplay, like, it, was like, it was like rip, just brackets growls is that all it was it, it had to have or been, did they right? phonetically yeah. type out like a <laughs> <laughs> it's so silly <laughs> there's it literally opens the movie or the wrestling part opens with him like shaking his face like a dog making dog yeah. sounds and you're just yeah. like well i know what's coming for the rest of this movie and it's a lot of that yes it is <laughs> um i don't know it, it's just it's a lot i think the stereotypes too it's the 80s yeah, but they, they like lay into yeah. that a lot so 10 bad there you go but how enjoyable did you find this movie on a scale of one to ten I laughed, um, not at the comedy for sure, but I laughed at the acting and at how ridiculous some of the stuff um, was. I enjoyed the little theme at the end. We finally got a payoff song at the end. That's yeah, not terrible. It's yeah, not a terrible it wasn't theme a bad song. theme. Yeah. I don't know why they didn't work in more of that earlier. Uh, like it felt like a wasted opportunity for me. Um, it was in some ways slightly nostalgic. Yeah. But but not enough to make me in, like enjoy it, really. I would say, for me, the enjoyability on this one was a five. Okay, that's actually higher than mine, which is funny, because we talked before we watched this. You asked if I'd seen this before. Of course I had. And I said I kind of uh, enjoy it as like a historical curiosity slash the nostalgia factor. Yeah. Man, again, I watched this, and I was just like, 10-year-old me was an idiot. Like, to, to even, maybe <laughs> yeah. I was eight, or who the fuck yeah. knows, but like, I like just to watch this like, as a kid and be like, hooray, like, it's Hulk Hogan doing what he does. No, man, this is bad, bad times. I laugh, too, again, not at the parts that were supposed to be comedy. A lot of the time, it was that kind of like eye roll, chuckle, like, oh, my God, that kind of thing. But there were a few of those. Um it, it in a weird way it captures a moment in time like of my childhood and so i'm always going to feel a little something for that but that was not enough to get me even as high as a 5 i this is a 3 enjoyable Ooh. but because of the freeze frame i will of course bump it up to a 4 the theme song is probably the best part of this and they give it to us right at the end so i kind of in a weird way my number might have been lower if it hadn't we hadn't gotten that high note there yeah that's fair i think that was the same for me i think i would have had it lower i think i didn't have a fond memory of it right i didn't have any preconceptions i obviously thought it was going to be a lot better than it was 
Um, but for me, this was sort of like a purely neutral movie. I wouldn't see it again. And the acting's so bad that there's no chance God, that you so could. fucking bad, man. <laughs> um, so that five take, was probably yeah. generous. Yeah. I, I'm a little surprised you came in high that high. I thought it was going to be like a two or something for you. So, yeah. uh, what did you think about this fucking barley wine? So, as someone who hasn't drank a lot of barley wine, um, I have enjoyed the experience, is what I would describe it as. The flavor itself is pretty malty. You get quite a lot of different flavor notes in it. You described once when we were talking barley wines having a bit of a root beer flavor, and I yeah. do. I even sense a little bit of that when I drink this. The alcohol is there. It is it not is there. Hidden. Yeah, you, you're not. You're not hiding it. Um, I. It's something I would like to try more of, but it's not something I would go to regularly. Like this is one where you're like, I'm gonna enjoy or experience a barley wine tonight, and then I'm not looking to get drunk or have a lot of beer. Right. This isn't something you do as a social thing. It's something you do to like taste and enjoy and experience. Yeah. This is a sipper. Yeah. We're both not finished and we've been recording now for a little over an hour. So that tells you normally we're cracking our second or third, by the time we're done one of these things, I will admit it was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, I was very nervous about this because I have very limited barley wine experience like yourself, the whole aged thing. I wasn't sure about it is a lot of like different flavor profile flavor profile. There's a lot of different like notes in here. Like you said, flavor wise, Like Great Lakes has done some good stuff in the past, and I'm sure if you are a barley wine fan, you're probably like, yeah, this is good. But for me, I don't think this is my kind of beverage, and I will, I will not be having the barley wine experience again. I don't think whatever the you're never going back to a barley wine, eh? No, unless we are pulling up for the podcast for some reason, I'm not going to do it. So nothing against the fine folks at Great Lakes, but this is just not my jam. And uh, still better than I thought, though. To be fair, like I was expecting this to be just horrible. I don't regret trying this. I don't regret that we got to talk about this ridiculous fucking movie. So. I would have never watched this, that's for sure, without the podcast. Um, (laughs) I don't necessarily recommend anyone else watching it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, go outside or read a book or something instead. This isn't worth your time. Well, there you go. Hopefully what will be worth our time is next week's movie. Next week, I don't know about you, this did not really satisfy my action movie craving. We haven't had like a straight up action movie in a while. That's going to change next week when we watch a little film called Champagne and Bullets. Oh, I, I don't know what this is about. Who's to be honest, this? I don't yeah. either. No? Uh, no, this is a Vinegar Syndrome release. It was released under their uh, VSA uh, series and apparently is just ridiculous. It's a, It will involve guns and criminals and all kinds of things. And actually, when we put a picture up on our social media of like a stack of movies I bought from Vinegar Syndrome, one of our social media followers suggested that we watch this and pair it with not just a beer, but also bourbon oh. <laughs> so next week we're going to be combining we're going to have a little champagne and bullet of our own on the alcohol side you can probably fill in the blanks on what those will be and we're going to watch what should be a ridiculous and hopefully very fun action movie more fun than this and a lot more action i'm excited uh i'm guessing that that is not going to have a pg rating and that we're going to get the stuff oh, that fuck i no. enjoy yeah. yeah we're getting we're going to get some real graphic shit which is going to satisfy some of my needs that were not met here there's going to be some blood there's going to be some violence there's going to hopefully be some nudity and yes. uh you know we'll yes. have a good time with that that'll be next week before then if you have not already please follow us on social media at the bmb podcast on twitter and instagram feel free to send us emails the bmb podcast at gmail.com absolutely we always love to hear from you and we hope you'll join us next week for champagne and bullets until then i'm cooper and i'm nolan and we'll see you next time on bad movies and beer keep on ripping yeah Rip em. No ring, no ref, no rule.